the potter. We read Romans 9, verse 19 to 29. The delightful aroma of fresh, wet clay hangs heavily in the air as I step into the potter's workshop. I'm excited. What will he make this morning? In the showroom, the most elegant artworks are displayed, offering a wide variety of choices. All the colours of the rainbow are presented, and there are items hanging from tiny to enormous. Cups, bells, candlesticks, pots. Come and look. I'm kindly invited behind the scenes to where the action happens. I step into a completely different world. Here it's somewhat messy if one dares use the word because the floor is wet and none of the sheen and glory of the showroom is visible here. Against one wall there's a massive kiln glowing from within with a heat that makes the hot place seem like a mere flicker. In the middle of the room stands the famous potter's wheel and the very place where the great wonders occur. The surroundings are far from clean. A muddiness surrounds the wheel and suddenly my thoughts wander back to when I was a little boy on Grandpa's farm at Waterfall Boefen. There was a clay pit near the spring with sticky, smooth blue clay. My friends and I often dug it out, getting incredibly dirty in the process. It was war clay, ammunition for clay fights. But sometimes it was also art play clay, which, uh, with which we made clay oxen and all sorts of wonderful things. I once tried to bake it in Granny's old coal stove, but it was a complete failure. I'm jerked back to reality as the potter takes a piece of clay and kneads it until it's delightfully elastic and malleable. With precision, he throws a piece of carefully measured clay onto the wheel. As the wheel spins, his artistic hands begin to shape something. What will come of this, I wonder excitedly. His hands are wetted and the clay makes them muddy, so that his hands and the clay on the wheel eventually become one. Slowly the object takes shape until he suddenly says, there it is, it's done. I cannot hide my disappointment. All he has made is a flat bowl. I wanted to see the potter create an intricate artwork, but now this, I don't understand. His talents are not being utilized. He reads the question mark on my face and then laughs. This is going to be a colorful fruit bowl. I will glaze it once the clay is dry, and then it will glow with the most cheerful colors. Yesterday we looked at predestination, and there are surely still many questions hanging in the air. Even Paul asked the question, Is God unjust? Professor John Haynes wrote his book Dog Dogmatics that God's grace is so great that he desires every person who believes in him to not be lost, but to inherit eternal life. For this, he has chosen humanity, and so you, I, and everyone who believes in him are chosen. The sad part, and I believe God shares in this sadness, is that some people reject his incomprehensible, undeserved grace in Christ 
and choose their own way of self-righteousness through so-called good works. Election, among many other issues, is incomprehensible to us. And we want to prescribe to God how things should happen. Paul compares God's actions to those of a potter. He has the freedom to do with the clay as he wills and to shape it according to his hand. Sometimes what he makes seems unfair to us. However, God's plan is so much greater than our minds can ever comprehend. Sometimes I want to ask, but why? Why didn't God make me a Billy Graham or an Andrew Murray? But I quickly forget that I was just a lump of dull clay before God started shaping me. He didn't need to do anything to me because I was utterly worthless. Nevertheless, out of grace, he took this worthless piece of slack, muddy clay and formed something useful for his kingdom. That shaping process was, of course, not always pleasant, as I had to be made different from what I was used to, and to become useful, I had to be glazed, I had to bake in a very hot kiln, figuratively speaking, of course. From my side, there was only one condition. I had to be willing, because without my own consent, God would not have started this process with me. What does this consent entail? To say yes to God's call and to accept Jesus' gift of eternal life. But it goes further. I must allow God to continue shaping me and making me useful. How do I do this? By leaving sin behind and equipping myself for His service. But most importantly, I must be willing to submit to God's shaping process, no matter how painful it sometimes might be. This means that I trust Him, the great artist with my life. Let's pray. Lord, Creator of the universe, today I place myself unconditionally in your artistic hands. Amen.